can you hear me? Just a quick check. I can hear you. Great. Okay. So it's nine o'clock. So let's get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to 2023's last Triangular Talk session. My name is Shreya Kalyan, and I'm the CEO of Quora Math Circle. Triangular Talks is a forum for students to interact with and hear directly from industry executives across various companies and organizations about how they use STEM concepts and problem-solving skills in their day-to-day -day work lives. Triangular Talks will be a series of one-hour online Zoom sessions consisting of three parts, an introduction, a presentation, and a Q&A session. These talks will revolve around one central idea, the triangle method for solving problems. This method begins with the problem. From that, one gets innovation, which one will finally use to solve the problem. To help students connect the doc dots between classes in real life, speakers will be asked what they do every day and how they apply their knowledge of STEM and problem solving. This in will introduce students to different industries and motivate them to nurture their problem solving skills and not give up. The most common questions asked by my students by students in any math class are, why are we learning this? Or when will we ever use this? This program will answer these questions and encourage students to take the initiative to learn and do more. That being said, today we're being joined by Mr. Jonathan Woodbury, a very talented person I've had the pleasure of knowing for years. He's worked as an economist for the US Congressional Budget Office and has spent a decade working as a climate policy analyst. Currently, he works out a software as a software engineer for Blue Origin. Mr. Woodbury has the most interesting stories to tell, and today he'll be sharing one of those with us. He spent a year in Antarctica, yes, you heard that right, Antarctica, as an astronomer, physicist, studying cosmic rays, solar, solar helio seismology, and having many grand adventures. Please welcome Mr. Jonathan Woodbury to talk about his Antarctic adventures. Oh, hi. Yeah, this is Jonathan. I hope you can hear me. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Hopefully you now see a blank screen and that's intentional. <laughs> I was uh, not um, clever enough to have a, uh, something to show for the first part of what I talk about. Um, yeah, I have had a bunch of very strange jobs, um, and they may seem like as if they have nothing to do with one another, uh, like being an economist for the uh, Congressional Budget Office, working on military matter, um, working entirely on military matters, military budget stuff, uh, working as an astronomer and a physicist in the Antarctica course, um, and then a climate, which I'll talk about today, and working as a uh, climate change person for 10 years. Um, and uh, every single one of my jobs, except for one, <laughs> has had something in common that they all involve adventure and discovery. And uh, I'll talk today about uh, using STEM skills, of course, uh, almost entirely. Um, and uh, that's a common theme for all of my jobs, um, except for one. <laughs> um, and my, my current job, job very much involves all of these skills. And um, I wish I would be able to show you and talk about what I do. In, the, in that job, but unfortunately I can't accept to say just the very you know, basic stuff. Um, but getting on to my main topic, um, I cannot say that I had a plan per se to learn STEM skills because it would make it easier to find a good job. Um, I looked at it from the other way around. Um, I crave discovery and learning and the thrill of a new challenge and the awesomeness of a blank piece of paper on which to start sketching out a plan. And discovery and challenges are not unique to science, math, and technology. And I personally would not want to limit myself just to science, you know, math, and technology. Um, but I happen to have a deep interest and uh, knowledge of you know, each of those three, um, but they are not enough in and of themselves. What I think is most important is the desire for discovery. And the flip side of that is a coin of the coin is the thirst for adventure. And I've been fortunate enough to have discovery and, and, and adventure be part of um, almost every job I've had. And STEM skills happen to be necessary, useful, and assumed. Oh, I've been getting it. We also can't see your, there we go. Oh, oh yeah, so okay. So, yeah, I'm not, I haven't shared any. Could you, could you hear me okay, what I said? 
Yep, we can hear, hear you perfectly fine. Right. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll, see, I have been fortunate to have you know discovery and adventure be part of almost every job I've had. And STEM skills happen to be necessary and useful for those jobs. But that was not why I was hired for any of them. Um, even to get to the interview, they just assumed that I had the necessary, you know, science, technology, or math skills. And I was never asked specifically about any of the, any specific skill in that area. Um, the the interviews always were about what um, I maybe say I was hired because I would know knew how to think and I, you knew how to have ideas, and they would just toss out questions about things that. I wouldn't be expected to know anything about and ask how I would approach that. And that is the skill set that is important. It's not like, do you know how to, no, nobody's ever going to ask you, how do you know how to differentiate something? Do you know how to solve, use calculus to solve a problem? They will always just assume that you already know how to do that. And they're asking you, how can you apply broader skills in order to solve a problem? Anyway, for example, um, in my freshman year of college, you know, just when I was just a few years older than many of you, probably just a year older, <laughs> I found a job ad on the bulletin board of the Department of Physics. And the job was to winter over in the Antarctic running a cosmic ray laboratory. I didn't know anything about the Antarctic. I knew very little about cosmic rays. But what I did know was that I wanted that job. And why did I want it so much? I can't really answer that, even to myself. The answer is an emotion, and it's really hard to explain why you feel an emotion. But I think the phrase winter over is what got me hooked. Wintering over means spending a complete year in the Antarctic and living through the long Antarctic night of continual darkness for four, uh, up to four months. Wintering over means experiencing intense cold, vicious storms, and a not insignificant amount of physical and mental risk. Wintering over means near complete isolation from the rest of the world. It's as if the rest of the world doesn't exist. Wintering over is about as close to living on another planet as it is possible to do on Earth. Wintering over means nonstop discovery and adventure, which I crave. And perhaps most importantly, I discovered just how much fun adventure is. Every single day was an adventure. And to get to the Antarctic, I went to Christchurch, New Zealand, and there boarded a very large US Air Force cargo plane for the five hour flight to the Antarctic McMurdo Station. And to get on the plane, it's sort of hard to imagine now, but to get on the plane, I did not need to go through security. I did not need to show a boarding pass. I did not need to show a passport. I just needed to show one thing, that I was wearing dog tags, military dog tags. And I didn't ask why we needed to wear dog tags because I was pretty sure I didn't want to know the answer. And this very large plane that I boarded, it was a four engine jet, does not land in the Antarctic on a nice long concrete runway. It lands in the Antarctic on floating sea ice. And hopefully, no, trying to get that to switch to floating sea ice. <laughs> Page down didn't work. Let me see why this is not changing. Can you see that? Yep, floating. we can see it. Okay, airplane on uh, floating sea ice. Probably that this thing. Uh, oh, well, that, that's close enough. Um, and it's very, you know, it lands up that's so with that white stuff there. That's ice. That's the frozen sea ice. Uh, and it's about to land on it. And that's the same size plane um, I flew. This is a more recent one, but I was on a C 141. And uh, as the plane approached the uh, landing, I was, you know, kind of apprehensive. You know, I knew that I was, it was landing on floating sea ice, but it turned out to be the gentlest and softest landing I had ever felt on a plane. I, I could barely notice when it touched down. 
And then when I exited the plane, I had this spectacular view of snow and ice in every direction, as far as you can see. And this picture doesn't quite do it justice, uh, but, but this is actually where I lived, right here in this building. This is where I lived and also where my lab was, with the, the equipment that I worked on. Um, and you know, there's snow and ice in every direction, and um, it's this you, can, you can't do it justice in a picture, um, but you it's impossible to overstate how brilliant and bright everything is there because the, everything is white, almost everything is white, or it's the blue sky. Um, this particular picture happened to be taken um, right around sunset when the sun goes down, so it's not quite as bright. But the air is so fantastically clear that things that are very far away appear much closer than they do. I remember when I first saw these mountains here, I thought that they were relatively close. But this one here, the top of it is 10,000, about 10,000 feet, and it's 60 miles away. And this one behind here, which is actually higher, it's about 10,000 feet high, uh, and it's about 70 or 80 miles away. But they just look so close as if you could just walk over to them. And this building here was the uh, my, my home for a year. Um, and this was my view. And I really regret not being able to look out every day at this view. And this is actually half the view. Um, if you, there's also a nice view from the angle where the camera is um, taking a picture. Um, the Antarctic is a very dangerous place. And one of the first things I needed to do when I got there was to attend survival school. And the school is taught by the search and rescue team so that perhaps they don't have to come and <laughs> search and rescue you, to keep their, you know, what they have to do down. And here is the classroom. This is the other direction from that other picture. Uh, that other picture was taken from right around up here. I don't know if you can see my mouse moving. Um, but this is looking the other direction and uh, that that is Mount Erebus. It's an active volcano. This. Um, this, this is not a puff of cloud up here. That that is the uh, there's a there's a molten lava lake up there, and it's steaming. And that that is what is causing this smoke. This is steam smoke from the um, volcano. And uh, the survival school was down here, right on, here on the base of uh, the the Ross Ice Shelf, where it meets Mount Erebus. And there we learned how to uh, various survival skills, such as uh, traveling roped together with crampons on our boots and how to rescue each of us um, when we each fell into a crevasse. And we each had to fall into a crevasse at least once to make sure we, that we knew how to uh, be rescued from it. And we learned how to climb up and uh, climb down a, a crevasse or an, an ice cliff. So this is a picture of me. Uh, I'm going down the uh, ice cliff here, but I had to go up to the very top and the top is about, I don't know, 20 feet above me, and the bottom is probably 25 feet below me. And the ladder there is just there for um, safety's sake. Um, we, we weren't supposed to use it if we, want, we want, if we wanted to be able to pass survival school, and, they, and no one needed to use it. And the next step was we had to learn how to uh, build a shelter that we would use to sleep in for the night. Um, and the group that I was in um, built a snow trench and, and this is on the Ross Ice Shelf itself. Uh, and we built a snow trench about six feet deep, maybe a bit more. And you can see the stairs, well, I mean, the, the stairs going down to it are here. And we carved out three bunks out of the side. And, um, and then we, there we slept for the night. And the inside of the snow trench uh, was probably about minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit, or I don't know what that is in centigrade, but minus 20, say, centigrade. Um, so it was pretty cold and out here on the surface, it was somewhat warmer. It was probably 10 or 15 degrees uh, centigrade, uh, Fahrenheit. And what is that minus five or minus 10 degrees um, centigrade? And you might be wondering, why is this guy only have a teacher? This, this is Bob. I, I still remember his name 40 years later. Uh, this is Bob and it was so much work, um, you know, build, doing all this that he, he heated up enough that even though it was like, you know, you know, 15 degrees Fahrenheit, um, it was warm enough. And the tools we used were all right here. It was just this small shovel and these small, uh, basically they're like saws. And you could just cut through the uh, snow and make blocks uh, very easily. That's how we made these 
the roofs for the shelter. Um, and that's all there was to it. Um, and uh, in addition to, uh, I mean, here I'm at the coast of Antarctica, um, and there's also the polar plateau, which is where the South Pole actually is. And I spent uh, about two weeks there. And this is what it looks like in every direction all the time. <laughs> it looks like nothing in every direction um, for all the time. And it's hard to describe, again, just what that feels like. But it's, um, I'm not even sure how to describe what it feels like. But it's just this intense feeling of nothingness in every direction. And it, fe it feels as if this goes on forever. You know intellectually that someplace out there it ends and the, the regular world begins. Um, but it does not feel that way when I was there. And it is so, e so easy, like driving a Sprite, which is a type of tracked vehicle across the polar plateau. It's so easy when you're driving that to think that you're actually in the middle of a giant snow globe because it looks white in every direction. And you can't tell looking down whether you're looking at a, like a, there wouldn't be any pens dropped on the snow, but if there were a pen dropped on the snow, you would not know that how big it was because there are no visual clues as to how big anything is and how far away it is. But the reason I was up there on the polar plateau at the South Pole uh, was to help my boss um, run a telescope that he essentially snuck into the South Pole to... Uh, trying to do astronomy at the South Pole. And this is my boss, um, Dr. Martin Pomerantz. And um, he first proposed the idea of a telescope at the South Pole because he thought it would be a great place to do solar helio seismography, which is the what uh, I mentioned and Shreya mentioned earlier. Um, and solar helio seismology is sort of like geology except applied to the sun. Uh, you may know from geology that the earth is ringing, sort of like whenever there's an earthquake, the, there's like shock waves or basically sound waves, pressure waves go through the earth. And you can use that to deduce various things about what's going on inside of the earth. And um, Martin Pomerantz's idea was to do the same thing, except at the South Pole uh, and with the sun. Um, and to see what kinds of vibrations are happening with the sun. Um, and when you try to do that um, from like, like here, like, you know, Southern California, you, you can only watch the sun for about 12 hours at the most, more or less, because it obviously arises and sets. But at the South Pole, you can watch the sun for many months at a time continuously. So this, you know, the, this camera would be moving around following the sun and able to take a continuous observations for, um, you know, 36, 48, you know, I, I forget what the maximum he was able to do it for. But because you can do that, you can see these very long vibration, they're called nodes, of the nodes of vibration that only happen, say, every 24 hours, every 48 hours. And so he basically created a whole new field of astronomy there to study the sun. And more importantly, this is, and so this is just a single telescope. Um, that he did, but this is what it looks like now at the South Pole, where that pic where that's in this almost the same place where that last picture was. There are many, many much much grander telescopes there. This particular telescope on the right is actually named after him. It's the Martin Pomerantz Observatory. This one here does cosmic um, microwave background radiation uh, measurements, and there's actually two other telescopes that are not in the picture, but um, uh, they, they are there. Um, and this whole area where all, all these telescopes are at, at the South Pole, is about half a mile away from the main South Pole station, and then keep it away from it so that they can minimize noise and light and, uh, you know, just regular pollution from vehicles. Um, and this whole area is now named officially after my former boss. Uh, it's, it's called Pomerantz Land. So the whole area is called Pomerantz Land, and this specific telescope is named after him. So I was really proud and very cool that I was able to have a tiny, 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 small part uh, in uh, creating this uh, whole new field of astronomy that is based um, at the South Pole. <clears throat> Let's see. And anyway, so yeah, I was only at the South Pole for about two weeks and most of my time was at McMurdo. 
And uh, what I always thought was the most special time in wintering over is the night. And this is a picture of the last time we would see the sun for four months. Um, so it might be hard to imagine, but this is sunrise, high noon, and sunset all at the basically the exact same time in the exact same place. So like a minute later, the, the sun was gone and we would not see it again for four months. And um, there are many crosses, uh, actually, um, before I get to that, you, you can sort of, get, th this actually is the same ice that the uh, airplane landed on. And it's, you can sort of maybe tell that it's sort of broken up and it actually has become sloppy ice and became an ocean <laughs> again. And, and now at this time of year, it's, it's reforming the ice. Um, so if a plane couldn't land on it now. Uh, it would immediately sink, but it's the it's re, re, the ice is reforming, and you know many months later it'll be thick enough for a plane to land on. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so there, there are many crosses like this uh, in the area around McMurdo, um, and you might guess that each cross represents the memor is place where somebody died, um, and this is Vince's cross. He was a member of the crew for Scott's expedition. That went, uh, that went to the South Pole in 1901, um, the earlier one. He went to the one in 1911 or so, he, the, where he died. It was an earlier, later one. But an earlier one was Scott in the, about 1902. Um, and this is where Vince was a member of the crew. And unfortunately, he fell to his death from this exact space where um, this picture is taken. Uh, and the cross is there to commemorate him. And he was just 22 years old when he died or when he fell to his death here. And I was 22 years old when I took this picture. And unfortunately, what, one aspect of the uh, night is that it's not a very good time to take pictures. <laughs> so I don't have any, many pictures from the, uh, from the darkness period. But I did have my most intense experience um, you know, in the Antarctic and perhaps even one of the most intense experiences of my, my life during the winter um, and it was on midwinter's day and we had not seen the sun for two months and we would not see it again for two more months we had not seen anybody from the outside world for longer than that for um, four months at that point um, so we had just seen a small group of people that we were with and um, we felt as if we were on a different we felt that we were not in the real world we felt that we were someplace else and on midwinter's day, the uh, Air Force uh, parachute supplies to us, re resupplies us with some you know, crucial things that we didn't have. And the plane cannot land there because it's far too dangerous for them to land. So they parachute stuff to us on midwinter's day, which is June 21st. Um, but a few minutes, I was outside. I, I was obviously going to go out and watch the airdrop. Um, in the darkness, uh, but a few minutes before the airdrop happened, I happened to look up as an astronomer at this beautiful stars and the aurora that were in the sky. And I saw high up a blinking light of the tanker aircraft that's used to refuel the cargo plane um, in, in midair. And just the sight of that blinking light against the stars was an, I don't know, an intense experience that I can't even, I can't describe even to myself, but I find it difficult to talk about it. If I, if I dwell on it too long, I'll actually start crying. So I, so anyway, so I don't even know what that, what that, what that meant, but just the idea that a blinking light of a cargo aircraft can have that much of an intense um, emotional reaction, I find very, um, you know, very interesting. <laughs> um, but eventually the darkness ends and the sun comes back and the sun hasn't come back yet, but this is like the dawn before the sunrise. And this is probably still a week before we actually saw the sun again, um, but it will rise uh, over there. We could tell that it was there and that felt so exciting to see the sky start to um, get uh, brighter. And you can sort of tell this flag is you know falling apart it's withering in the um, after the, all the wind. I mean, the wind is very strong there, um, and it's tore apart this uh, flag. Um, and of course, I was a scientist there. Um, every single day that I was there, I did science stuff. Um, 
but none of it is probably what you might think a scientist does. And almost every bit of work I did meant trying to figure out why something was not working the way it was supposed to do and trying to find out how to make it work again, despite having zero of whatever you need to make it work again. And I think this is one of the best skills that a person can have uh, dealing with ambiguity, how, in, how to solve a problem when you have nothing to solve it with, basically. And this is a key skill for any STEM field, how to figure out stuff and how to make it work again. And this could be a mathematical proof. It could be uh, working literally with scientific equipment like I was doing here, or even if you're a theoretical physicist, trying to figure out what is the missing piece of the puzzle that you're not realizing. And if you can figure out that missing piece of the puzzle, that will solve the whatever the problem is that you're trying to solve. Um, and even I, I just maybe a few weeks ago, I watched a video going back to this uh, of the person of the woman who is running this telescope here at the South Pole now. And the way she described her work running this telescope was exactly the same as what I just described. It's trying to figure out why something's not working and how to get it working again. So, and it, that was exactly the same thing I did when I was at this, when I was in Antarctica. And it's actually even the same thing I do every day in my current job. Um, I work as a software developer for Blue Origin, which you may not know, but we build rockets and things for the moon and, and whatnot. So every single thing I do every single day is involved with rockets and with lunar landers and things like that. And I wish I could describe it more, but that basic pattern is the same. It's something's supposed to work one way. It didn't work that way. And how do you figure out what's wrong and how do you make it work? And that often is not necessarily like a problem with the mechanics or a problem with the software. It's a problem with understanding what it is you're trying to do and solving those problems are um, what's really important. It's not so much important about how do you do a derivative or something like that. It's how do you solve a problem that nobody has ever had to solve before. Um, and one thing I, 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 I think almost as important as sort of the, the STEM skills are the soft skills. And the soft skills, which I use every I, I use every day in every job, <laughs> Again, but it's a soft skill is like knowing who do you go and ask for help? And who do you go to ask for a favor to help you solve the problem? And, and this was really useful in the Antarctic. How do you get a bunch of stuff that you need to solve whatever you're doing when you're not actually supposed to be able to get it? Um, like uh, when I was in the Antarctic, uh, it was run by the Navy. Uh, all these, all the supply stuff was run by the Navy. And I had, technically I had no business getting any of their supplies. But I always did, and I always did because I do a way around the official way that I would be denied it the official way, but if I did it by alternative means, uh, I was able to get the job done. Anyway, that's all I have really. Um, I guess I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about anything. I'll leave the image up just because it's sort of nice to look at. Maybe I'll put the uh, Southwest one up. <laughs> That's the, the most sciencey one out there. If any students have any questions, you guys are welcome to go ahead and ask them or put them in chat. Um, while we wait for some, oh, I see a hand. Akshara, what question did you have? So, oh, um, what was your boss's name again? Oh, what was my what? Your boss's name again. Oh, Martin A. Pomerantz. So you, you can call him. Uh, P -S, his last name is P-O-M-E-R-A-N-T-Z. And, and he was uh, quite a force of nature. Um, I mean, I mean, he, um, I mean, I'll put the picture of him up. Um, uh, I mean, he was definitely a pure scientist, um, but uh, he, um, those soft skills I mentioned, those were even more important in, in, in a very different way. We had an expression about him 
that he knew how to sell what he was doing. He was a scientist. He wanted to get do, do science, but he had to get money to do it. And he had to sell the science and why it was important. And we had an expression about him that he could get money out of a dry rock. You squeeze a dry rock and money comes out. Um, and But he was also a terror to work for. Uh, he's... Um, he chewed me out several times and not entirely nice ways. <laughs> um, and, but that's just because he was so committed to what he was doing. Um, but on the flip side of that, the nicest compliment I ever had and the one I treasured the most was from him. Um, and it's a compliment that means something to me. I, if I told it to, to any of you, it probably wouldn't um, resonate with you, but it very definitely resonated to me and he meant it to resonate. He was clever enough to know what it was that would resonate with me and gave it to me in that way because he knew that I would get the most out of it. Um, but yeah, he was a very, very cool guy to work with or work for. Thank you. Arsh, you have a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, do you know about how strong, like how fast the wind speeds were in Antarctica? Oh, uh, yeah. So, well, there, there's a, um, where I was on the coast, uh, there's a, a type of wind called catabatic winds. Uh, and catabatic winds are a type of wind, um, I, I believe that's their formal na name, but uh, they actually occur in many parts of the world. Uh, in fact, if you're, I don't know if you're in Southern California, but in Southern California, we call them Santa Ana winds. Uh, yeah, but Santa Ana winds are actually the same thing as catabatic winds, which are also the same thing as Chinook winds in Colorado and um, in France. The southern France are called the Mistral. But anyway, but so the catabatic winds in the Antarctic are the ones that are by far the, the strongest, um, and they go up to 200 miles per hour, uh, which is, you know, way, way, way beyond a, a hurricane force winds. Um, and they're very, and they're sort of strange in, too, because they, they actually hug the surface. So if um, at the very surface, like you were standing on the ground, you would feel them. But if you actually just went 10 or 15 feet up, you would not feel the wind at all. It's only in the first 15 feet. Um, and there's a French base called Dermont Derville, um, which is built even um, also on the coast of Antarctica. And it's actually built up on stilts so that uh, it's above the, where the catabatic winds come through. Um, and so you, they don't feel them. I mean, well, I mean they, they don't feel them at a station to go down to the surface, of course, to feel them, but they, 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 they raise the buildings above the wind so that they don't have to be quite as strong as they otherwise might have to be. Uh, where I was, um, uh, we, we didn't raise the buildings. We, they were on the surface. Um, I guess I could go back to that picture. Here, um, so like um, one time, this, this my building here is about half a mile or a mile away from the main base, and I would walk back and forth on often, not all the time, but I would walk back and forth often. And one time, I don't know if you can, it's a little bit embarrassing to say, but I once actually screamed, I cursed at the wind because I was so annoyed with it. I mean, because um, basically I was just walking along and it just blasted me, um, and it actually threw me down to the ground. Um, but it did that sort of um, very unexpectedly. It was a sudden gust, boom, and then I, there, there I was on the ground. Um, so I guess, I guess that stimulated my fight or flight instinct. It made me, you know, briefly angry. And when, of course, it's ridiculous to, <laughs> to yell at the wind because the wind is not a, it, 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 not a not a thing to yell at, or it's not, not going to obviously care. But um, the, the string the wind was very brutal um, there, and also that made the wind chill very brutal because the air temperature in the winter might be say minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit and that's actually the same in centigrade um, but but when you add wind chill to that it would go down to minus 100 uh, or below minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit um, and it's hard to describe what that feels like but it, it feels like intense pain <laughs> um, it feels like the bones in your head are freezing contracting because the air is so cold that it's making the bones in your skull um, Contract. No. Thank you. No. And then Ayush has a question. Oh, I, I can't hear you. Were you? 
I can't hear is it. maybe in the chat, in the chat I can read. Um, I, I, I don't see, I, can, you, can you put that in, in the chat, Ayusha? I, I, can, I can't hear you. Oh yeah, where, where were you in Antarctica? In, oh, I was in for both, in, in the summer and the winter. Um, so I, I spent a full, actually I spent um, 13 months there. Um, I arrived in October uh, and I left in November of the following year. Uh, in the first three months, uh, which would have been October, uh, no, actually four months, October, November, December, um, right, uh, up until February, <laughs> uh, we, we call the summer and we call anything else the winter. Uh, and the summer is when the sun is up 24 hours a day. And the, the day that I arrived was actually, the, happened to be the day that the sun stayed up uh, for good. Um, so I, I saw just perpetual daylight for the first four months that I was there. Um, and um, the station closes in, um, in, in the mi middle of February, end of February, or middle to end of February. And, and, and that means that um, all the, um, you, you, you no longer can come or go from the base, that the last plane leaves in February. Um, and once you're there, you're stuck and there's nothing you can, there's no, no, possible, no possible way that you can leave until the following um, um, August to, to November when flights re return. Um, and the summer and winter are very, very, very different. Um, you know, like the summer, it's, it's more or less like living in anywhere else except it's colder. Um, but in the winter, it feels and is very different because of the isolation. Um, and, uh, it feel, and again, that feeling that you're not living on the earth anymore, you're living on another planet. Uh, because you're totally isolated, you, you have no possible way that you can leave. Uh, in some respects, you're more isolated than astronauts in space because astronauts going around the Earth or even if they go to the moon, they can, in, in case of emergency, return to the Earth within a few days and within a few hours to a few days. Um, but where we were in Antarctic, and this, this applies to other stations as well, even more so to like the South Pole Station, there, there is really hardly any chance to leave. Um, only if you have the most... Uh, some very, very, very bad condition. Um, uh, will they actually send in a plane in the winter to, to get somebody out? And that, as far as I know, that's only happened twice. Um, and, it, and it probably costs like a, many, many, many millions of dollars uh, and endangers lots of other people's lives as well. So that, that's only been done twice as far as I know. Um, I mean, you look at the other... Um, yeah, so I was there in the summer, and, went, and, and for the um, and, and only about ten thousand people in the history of the world have wintered over in the Antarctic, um, and you know that, that would be just like a relatively small stadium. So that that applies to everybody for the last hundred years from all all countries, you know, not just the U.S. but every other country that does it. Um, and it's it's hard to estimate what the exact number is, but it's you know maybe on the low side it might be five thousand, and on the high side it might be about. Um, uh, 10,000. You see, and then how, yeah, let's read the next question is, how, how did you find food sources in Antarctica? Well, they, that, that was all shipped in. So uh, there's a huge uh, logistical uh, operation to make sure that we have enough supplies. Uh, for McMurdo, where I was, uh, I mentioned that this is floating sea ice, so it's still frozen here, if you can see the background. But that does melt, and uh, two U.S. Coast Guard icebreakers uh, come in every year to break up the ice, um, and they allow and, and they escort two ships. Uh, one ship is an, an oil tanker that delivers oil, um, and another um, uh, is a, basically it's a regular cargo uh, ship that uh, um, delivers cargo, you know, food and other cargo. So the, the, we had a huge stockpile of that. Um, and, and they also make sure that you have at least two years supply of fuel and two years supply of food uh, at the station because there's a, some chance, which is, has never happened, but it's, there is some chance that it, the whole, you, they will be unable to bring supplies the following year. So they give um, at least two years supply of food um, and fuel to be on hand at, at every base. Uh, and that's particularly difficult for the South Pole Station because the South Pole Station, um, for most of it, like when I was there, you, you could they could not take cargo to it um, on the ground. They had to fly it in. 
so they had to fly in all the fuel and fly in all the food and fly in everything. Um, and that is extremely expensive and, and extremely difficult because the uh, the cargo planes that can t take them there are relatively small and it can take a relatively few uh, cargo or fuel because um, they have to take off from um, snow. So they, they, take, they have to use a lot more power to get lift off and so they, they can't be as heavy as they would say if they're on a concrete runway and then the south pole itself they, they land on um that that you know image of the <laughs> that they land on that basically um and that uh it has a lot of resistance so and, and they land on skis they obviously can't land on um uh, wheels because the wheels would just dig into the snow or ice. Um, so anyway, so it's, it's a huge logistical problem for the, every U.S. station, but in particular the South Pole stations, inland stations, to get supplies there. Um, that is a little bit easier now. Uh, since about the year 2000, they have been able to do what are called overland, overland polar traverse to take supplies to the South Pole. So they, they, they get them to a McMurdo, where I was by ship, as I mentioned, but then they can load them onto basically the train of lots of uh, tractor vehicles that go as a big unit across to the South Pole. Um, and that is very difficult because they have to, McMurdo is at sea level, um, but the South Pole is actually at about uh, 10,000 feet elevation. Um, this ice here you see in the background is, is at an elevation of 10,000 feet. So they have to climb, basically climb a mountain to get up there and they go up what's called the Beardmore Glacier. Um, and you can Google that, uh, and it's, uh, you know, I believe, the largest glacier by far in the world. Um, and, I, and when I remember flying over the Beardmore Glacier, at its uh, narrowest point, the Beardmore Glacier is something like 10 times longer at its narrowest point than the largest glacier outside of the Antarctic is. So you can imagine the glaciers in the Himalayas or the glaciers in the you know, the Alps and other places, uh, glaciers in the Andes, um, the longest one of those is 10 times the size of the Beardmore Glacier at its shortest point. Uh, did you see any dangerous uh, predators that could harm you? Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, although maybe not necessarily what you expect. Um, they, 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 the, the predators themselves will not get you well, unless you're in the ocean and then of course there's sharks in the ocean but I, I, I'm not going to count those um, there, there, are, there, are, there is only one land predator that would have been of, of concern um, and they are called skuas and skuas are um, sort of like large um, um, seagulls that, that you might see near the ocean except that they're much larger and they're much much more um, aggressive, um, and they won't actually attack attack you. They they recognize that you're too large, but if you have something on you that they want, they will get it. Um, and um, and this was against the rules. But I remember two of my Navy friends. Um, they would um, they had two pet schools that they called them Bubba and Fred. Uh, and you, you can just go outside in their building. They had a building like the one I had. Um, and they could just like toss food into the, I mean, there might be like a hurricane going on, you know, like 60 mile an hour winds. They would just toss like a hot dog into the air and a school of bird would catch it in midair and eat it in midair and just continue to flap there, <laughs> watching you wanting another thing. Uh, schools are, um, they're, they're sort of the, the bad guys of the Antarctic because they're what penguins um, are most concerned about, uh, at least on land. Um, the schools will try to get the penguin chicks. I mean, just like that hot dog, they'll eat the hot dog out of the air. But the school will also try to get a penguin chick, which is about the size of a, a fist, maybe, um, and try to eat it. Or, and they would eat it if they can catch it. So they, they are a major predator for um, penguins. Uh, there are killer whales. I did see killer, the spouts of killer whales. Um, so I guess that they would be a predator because the, they are the predator of penguins when the penguins go into the water. Um, but I, I wasn't worried about them um, uh, as a, I guess, a human walking around outside. But yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, what's the next question? Do you just a couple hundred? Uh, 
yeah, the 300 club, um, I, I, yeah, you have to be at the South Pole to participate in the 300 club. Uh, and I, I, when I was there, everyone at the South Pole did it. And I, I have a picture of them doing it. Um, but, but yeah, you, there's a sauna in one of the buildings that's, you know, plus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and you go in there for like a minute or two, and then you have to run outside. Um, and it's not, I wouldn't call it a short run. It's, I don't know, maybe 100 yards, maybe more. Uh, and you have to go to the ceremonial South Pole from there. And, and you have to do this naked. <laughs> and you have to do it, including bare feet. Um, and you have to run to it. And then you run back. Uh, and you have to stay outside it, when it's below minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So that the temperature difference is, you know, plus 200 to minus 100. Um, you could not do that at where I was, McMurdo Station, because it wasn't, it didn't get cold enough to do the minus 100 part. It, the coldest it got was like minus 150, so maybe you could do uh, the minus, uh, you know, the Club three, 250. <laughs> um, but we had a different version. Actually, the New Zealand base had a different version of it. Um, this was strictly forbidden for the Americans to do it, um, but uh, but everyone everyone did it anyway. They had to say that it was not allowed, but you could just do it too. Um, and that was the Ross Island Swim Club. So um, going back to this picture, actually this, no, yeah, this picture, uh, they would cut a hole in the ice here um, and you would have to run out again naked uh, from the helicopter hangar that the, the New Zealanders had and then jump in and go down deep enough so that your head was covered with water and then come back out and run back to the helo pad. Um, I, I actually did not do that. I sort of regret not doing it. Um, but, uh, you know, many others did it. Um, and of course the, the, uh, I mentioned that the U S Navy, the U S Navy ran most of the base while I was there and they had an officer in charge, uh, Tim Bond. And he, um, I shouldn't have, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned his name, <laughs> uh, but, but he had you know, given written out the memo that said, we are, we are all forbidden to do it because blah, 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 safety reasons and all that sort of stuff. But he actually did it himself. So he violated the rule that he had just said that. He couldn't do it, um, but he did it himself, and he wouldn't have been angry. Or he didn't definitely was not angry at anybody who wanted to do it. Uh, let's see. Next question: um, Did you see any animals there? Yes. Um, yeah, of course, the school birds that I mentioned—they uh, were relatively um, um, un uninteresting. I mean, they're interesting for a while. It's interesting to watch how they could just stand motionless in the air, despite there being these horrific gusts of wind and very high speed, you know, like the gust of wind that blew me over and made me curse at it. Um, th these school of birds didn't care at all about that. They were just, you know, just hanging out there, just like totally relaxed. Uh, and they could just, you know, somehow just make some small adjustment to their wings and, and stand and, and stay mo motionless in, in the air. Um, but I did see penguins, um, and that was a big deal. Um, I remember um, I was actually at the, my building here, and it was about 1.50, I think it was around 1.30 a.m., um, and of course it was totally bright, um, uh, but a shuttle bus driver who I knew, um, they, they, it was like a taxi service. The shuttle buses would go back and forth between the American base and the New Zealand base and the airstrip, and they, those ran 24-7. But anyway, the shuttle bus driver stopped at my place at... Um, 1 30 a.m one day and she said that they were uh, penguins spotted at a certain place and then so i went with her to the uh see the penguins so i, I do have pictures of it i just didn't think to include it in in this talk um but with me with the penguins um it, we never called them penguins so we always called them penguinos um i'm not entirely sure why but we called them penguinos um and one thing i was in, in the most of the ones i saw were adelie penguins um and they were sort of fun to, you know, in some places I could get close enough to them, like maybe four or five of them together, and you could start talking to them. Um, and um, I don't want to do it because it would look sort of ridiculous, but you, you have to actually imagine yourself with the penguin and start making this similar sounds that the penguins make, and they will reply. And, and that was a lot of fun to do that and hear what their, um, what their replies were. <laughs> um, and I did see killer whales. I think I mentioned that. Um, and how many years was I in the Antarctic? Uh, I was there for uh, 13 months. Um, I might have been there a little bit longer. Um, my, my boss, Pomerantz, there. Um, let's see, where is he again? 
this guy uh, during the winter he sent me a sort of a oh anyway, during the midwinter airdrop he sent me a letter and he asked me whether I would consider going back to the South Pole for that upcoming summer to help with that astronomy experiment that I was doing. Um, and I said, yes, I would, but, but he asked me to reply in code um, because I, I believe that the NSF who were funding the, the, this work, I, I assume that was probably against the rules somehow. So he asked me to reply in code. Um, I, I did send these sort of like, sort of like telegrams um, once a week, basically with the scientific results and what the status was and all that sort of stuff. But those messages went by the, went via the US Navy. Um, so I, I, so I know I, I, I had to put some code word in there to say whether or not I was going to uh, agreed, and I, I said that I would agree. Um, so I would have spent the following summer there until February. Um, so I would have ad added another three or four months. Um, but unfortunately, the equipment um, I'm not sure what it is on the on back here in the background <laughs> of this picture, uh, but something on there wasn't ready. So he uh, he didn't need it. I could I couldn't do it. Um, and I actually have my eye on <laughs> may, somehow trying to figure out a way that I can get back here and work on either of these two things. Um, I, I think I have the skills to be able to do it. I, actually, I'm not worried about that. Um, I, um, but that, I guess it's, it's how to approach getting the job. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in exploring that, <laughs> to go back there and do that. I think that would be very cool to um, I mean, both this because it's innately cool, but I think um, my boss, Pomerantz, would like it very much if um, one of his uh, people, <laughs> he, he considered all of the people like me who work, did the work for him at the, in Antarctica, which is not just me, it's maybe 30 or 40 people over, over the course of the years. Um, he would be very happy if one of his people came back here to work at Pomerantz land. Um, See how did climate change affect it? I, since I haven't been back since I was there, I I, I do look at a websites with uh, basically the webcams of the Antarctic, and it, it seems as if it's not getting as cold as it was, and it seems as if the summertime temperatures are warmer than they were. Like when when I was there, the warmest it ever got was briefly it got to freezing, so thirty two degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. Um, uh, but it seems like the, it's actually been going up into the 40s now. Um, and but I don't, I, it could have been that I was there for a cooler year, uh, and and it was was isn't that different. But my um, my sense is that it's getting warmer. Um, and um, I guess it's not directly a climate change thing, but one thing that you, you recall the ozone hole that was discovered over the Antarctic. Uh, and that was actually I was actually there when that was discovered. I mean, where the measurements are taken that showed that the ozone hole was there. Um, and, and those were uh, maybe a year or two later uh, was published the article that showed that the ozone hole was there. And I mentioned that I worked as a climate uh, policy analyst uh, in uh, also. And anyway, the, the guy who discovered the ozone hole was a guy named Sherry Rowland. And you can look him up, he won a Nobel prize for it. Um, but, I, but he was one of my, he wasn't a colleague of mine, but I worked with him in, in that other job that I had as a climate change person. Uh, and I was, you know, very interesting. And, and I, I, I certainly knew who he was when I worked with him, but he had not yet won the Nobel, Nobel Prize uh, in uh, chemistry for it yet. See, if you want to become an aeronautical engineer, what areas of expertise do you need? Um, what's... Um, what, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an aeronautical engineer, so I'll, I'll have to just slightly, um, uh, I'm not sure what that means. So don't, don't, don't take what I say is a definite truth, but the people I work with, um, many of them are aeronautical engineers, uh, and they do that. So it, so being, being very familiar with calculus and using calculus to, to solve problems, I mean, that's true of, a, of any STEM skill. Um, having a lot, a lot of knowledge of the structural properties of, of different materials, um, and then the, the and, and I guess this is more the engineering, which is I guess less the less that I know. But how do you uh, know how to build things that meet a certain requirements for structural load or heat load or performance load, and how do you be able to make those? Uh, and, you know, it's one thing to be able to you know have some wonder wonder material that can withstand all these different forces, but it's quite another thing to be able to mass produce that uh, in a um, 
settings so that if you're building airplanes, you can make you know air, airplanes at scale and um, and reliably and repeatedly. And in the case of my current job, I'm making rocket stuff um, reliably and repeatedly. So uh, I, I see that a lot in the, the work I do. Um, in fact, that's uh, in some respects more important than the actual initial design. It's how to how, it's how do you make a design that you can build. And that second part is uh, perhaps the more complicated part. Uh, let's see, you're running. Ah. Oh, I guess we're not, well, at least when I was there, you had to do that naked. <laughs> maybe, maybe that changed the rules um, because every, every, back, back in my day, uh, everything wasn't so, people didn't have so many cameras around. And also you couldn't, uh, I guess one thing you couldn't, when I was there, it was very, very difficult to take a picture outside because the camera would freeze within moments and you can only have like a, you would have it underneath your parka come out take a picture and put it back and if you had it out for more than a few seconds it would freeze and stop working um i i gather that uh, the you know i modern cameras work better than that now but um but anyway so maybe that's why they had to change the rule that you um <laughs> just have to run around the building oh challenging thing i experienced in the antarctica well, by, by far, I think the thing that affected me the most was whatever it was that make, makes me almost want to cry when I think about that blinking light. And I'm not exactly sure what it was that affected me, but I, I mean, something that was probably subconscious was affecting me. Um, that that um, blinking light, I think it showed that there was a connection that the outside world still existed. And, and then part, part of my brain... Uh, being there, you know, mammalian brain um, doesn't think about, doesn't think rationally. It just thinks you're in this awful isolated place where people are not supposed to be or something like that. And seeing the blinking light of the plane. And, and one thing I remember having this, this thinking about for days afterwards was that there were people on that plane and they were maybe a, a, a few miles away from me up in the air. Um, and just a few hours later, they could be in a city and going out to dinner, or they could go to a store. They could go. They, they could go go do something. And, and it, I just found that so hard to imagine that somebody could still do that because where I was, it was just like it was sort of like a dream that someday you'll be able to go out and go go to a restaurant or go out to the store or get something or you or even just walk out on the grass. I, re I remember clearly times just getting so sick and, <laughs> sick and tired of walking on volcanic rock <coughs> excuse me volcanic rock and wondering what is it like to walk on soft grass and feel a gentle breeze instead of that you know fierce wind that makes you want to curse at it <laughs> i think that's all the questions i see in the um in the chat um i don't, I don't I hope i did i hope i didn't miss any We'll give the kids another minute or two to ask any final questions, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Just in case it triggers any questions, my, my current job is with Blue Origin, uh, and we're you know we're trying to be like SpaceX. Um, we we want to be able to launch uh, rockets repeatedly. Uh, we do we do, we don't have one that's similar to the Falcon 9 that you see being launched all the time. Uh, we have one that's much larger. It's more like the Falcon Heavy. Uh, it's not quite as big as the not Falcon Heavy, the the, the spaceship one, the the one um, the the, uh, the one that you know they tried to launch a few weeks ago and it almost worked but didn't quite work. But anyway, we have one that's almost the same size as that. It's a little bit smaller. It's about the size of the. Um, the Apollo rockets, um, and we're working on that and hope to get that launched relatively uh, soon. Uh, and we also recently won a contract to build a lunar lander to go to the South Pole of the Moon, not the South Pole, not the South Pole in the picture, but the South Pole of the Moon itself. Um, so, if you have any sort of general questions about that, I can answer them. I, I unfortunately, I wish I could talk to you about how incredibly cool it is to work on this stuff and specifics about what, what I even did this last week. Um, I mean, I, I mean, there was like this email about something that I can't say, talk about, and there were only like five people on the email and one of them was me. And I was looking at what are the job roles of these other people on the email? 
and, and they're like, I don't know, they're they're like a far extreme, total rocket science kinds of people. And I can't imagine that I'm actually on the same email with these people. Um, in, in, I wouldn't say an equal, but um, is, but in some way we're talking about the same issue and, and that I'm on that. So um, if, if that triggers any questions, that's fine too. <laughs> oh, here's a question. Um, how cold was the temperature in Antarctica during the summer and winter? You have a summer where in McMurdo, the highest it got was freezing. Uh, but at the South Pole, when I went to the South Pole, I went there in the there, summer. So it was the highest temperature there. And it was about minus five degrees Fahrenheit was the highest it ever was when I was there. Um, and, and then the winter for McMurdo, the coldest temperature, ambient temperature was minus 54 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and the minus coldest wind chill was you know, well below minus 100. It actually goes off the scale. Um, you should try to look it up. It doesn't tell you anything below minus 100. Um, and then South Pole, it gets much worse. Uh, South Pole, um, it, the year I was there was actually the coldest temperature South Pole ever reached, uh, even I believe today in 1983. I mean, that was minus 116 or something like that. I, I may, maybe a little bit off. Uh, that's off the coldest ever in Antarctica. I believe that's from the Vostok Russian station, which is slightly colder. But anyways, it's minus 100 and crazy degrees. Um, and how was it like to come back to America and spend... Uh, oh, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't describe it as America, but it, it was a very strange experience when flying back from the Antarctic. Um, I, I happened to be with one of my friends from the South Pole, and I was on a C-1... Uh, Kiwi Air Force... Um, uh, L, uh, New Zealand Air Force uh, C-130 uh, aircraft um, and um, th that aircraft had bunks in it and I was actually lying down in the bunk sleeping and then my um, my South Pole counterpart he woke me up and said John we're home uh, and, and even <laughs> sorry even remembering those words as you can see that still triggers <laughs> Anyway, so you can, you can see what, what that, how intense of an experience that was to return. And I remember looking outside the window and wondering why there was all that fuzzy stuff on the um, on the hills. And I, I realized eventually that that fuzzy stuff was trees. I, I guess I had forgotten all about trees. Um, and one other unusual experience of that was as soon as they opened up the door of the um, airplane, just like opening the door on, on a plane that you're on, uh, instantaneously, I could feel or I could smell the the smell of um, growth of green stuff. I mean, it's it's a it's it's a smell that you're not even aware that you have. But I, I had been outside of smelling that for 13 months, and then as soon as I got there, I could immediately smell this this. Uh, I'm not even sure what to call it the scent of growth or the scent of plants. And that went away after maybe six hours. I didn't notice it, and I haven't, haven't noticed it since. But that was also another in, intense experience. All right, we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you so, so much for sharing all your experiences about Antarctica. We had a lot of questions from our students eager to hear about your many experiences. And I hope you continue to have very cool experiences with that. Thank you so much for joining us to both Mr. Jonathan and our students. Okay. Yeah. Happy to be here. And done. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you.